Hello and welcome to St James Church in Rowledge. My name is Adele Regan and I'm the Youth and Children's Minister here. Today I'm going to be leading us through our worship and Russ Parker will be bringing us a message from God as well. But before we begin our service, I would like to say um, a happy pride to anybody who's part of the queer community and any allies as well. Um, we want you to know that you are loved by God and you are welcome. So let's start our worship by having our first couple of songs. For the battle over death is won 
I hope you were able to um, sing your heart out there or maybe just to sit and reflect on the words that were being sung. Now before we move on in our service I'd like to tell you a little bit about something very exciting coming up in our village called Rowledge 150 and actually I'm not going to tell you about it I'm going to show you a video of how you can get involved and what it's all about. Check this out. It's a real pleasure to be here to launch the Rowledge 150 Challenge. What is it, you might say? Well, this year, between the 21st of June and the 11th of July, we're asking people to challenge themselves to absolutely anything to raise money for our local community. It's in aid of Rowledge and celebrating 150 years since the consecration of our lovely village. The idea is that during this period, you can challenge yourself to absolutely anything you like. All we ask is that it's a bit of fun and you can try and raise some money for Rowlish School and also for St James's Church. At the same time, we're gonna put on some other events and those details will be released soon, such as a scavenger hunt. And we just want to make it really good fun, get the whole of Rowlish together and do something to celebrate this momentous time. Maybe you could try some of these. Church. One hour later. Ninety-nine. One eternity later. Hundred and fifty. Maybe to make some money you could bake some cakes and sell them. Whatever your age, you can bake cakes or biscuits and enjoy them. Maybe you can go for a run in the forest. Forty-nine, can you do 150 press-ups? Maybe the teachers of Rowley School can have a go at do, doing some of this.
So get your thinking caps on. I really hope you're going to be able to get involved with Rowledge 150 and uh, hopefully to raise a bit of money for St James's Church and for Rowledge Primary School as well. We're now going to have our Bible readings. Today's readings will be read continuously. The first reading will be Mark chapter 1 verses 9 to 13 and the second reading will be Luke chapter 4 verses 14 and 15. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Immediately, the spirit drove him into the wilderness and he was there in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan and was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered to him. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. Good morning. I wonder if you recognise this reading from a well-known novel. Here's the opening lines. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, we had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. Quite a mix and match message from the opening lines of A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. But it aptly summarises what we've all been travelling through to some degree in this COVID pandemic. Here's just a reminder of some of those effects of the lockdown which we've all been going through, and thankfully some of which, if not most of which, are being lifted. But there was no touching, there was no standing close, there was no proper seeing ourselves because we all wore face masks. There was isolation and quarantine and PPE. There was the fear of infection and our schools were closed. Travel was restricted. And sadly, the pain of dying without families being present. Funerals were reduced to handfuls in attendance. And we switched to a digital connecting lifestyle as opposed to a face-to-face -face living. Now, all of these connect with our two readings this morning. Because I want to just do a simple comparison with you of this journey we've all been going through, whether we're Christian or no, or have another faith particularly. But I want to compare the pandemic lifestyle we've been going through as a kind of desert discipleship. Our two readings are like bookends of a lockdown restriction on Jesus. The first one is him going into the desert which we get from Mark chapter 1, verse 12. And the second verse that we read was from Luke 4, verse 14, of how he came out of that experience. What was the end product for him? And I want you to notice the contrasts. We're not told that Jesus strolled into the desert because he fancied a staycation in a kind of um, desert kind of place. Mark's version is very graphic. It says he was driven into the desert to be tempted by Satan. And the word driven there in Greek is the word ekbalo. It's the traditional word used of delivering someone from the powers of darkness. And here is Jesus being delivered into the desert to confront 
those same powers of darkness. From the moment of being affirmed as God's lovely son, in whom the father is well pleased, to the emptiness of the desert, and the only company he has at some stage is the dark Lord himself. And in Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 14, we're told the end game, that Jesus comes out of his lockdown restrictions in the power of the Spirit, and he moves immediately into ministry, and this ministry has authority and effect because everyone took notice of him. Where did he get this authority from? And you and I now know that that was partly derived from the experience of desert and battle. I think as we journey, hopefully, through the other side of this pandemic and are coming to the time when the lockdown restrictions are being lifted, that we can reflect and learn our own version of desert discipleship. So let's just look, shall we, at a brief overview of what the Bible teaches us about the significance of the desert. There are just four things I want to tease out. Number one, the desert in the Bible is the crucible for creating the faith community, particularly of Israel. Six times we're told in the book of Exodus that Moses confronted the dictator of his day, Pharaoh, with those familiar words to us, let my people go. But six times Moses says, God says, let my people go so that we can worship him in the desert. I find that fascinating. It doesn't say in the promised land, in the land flowing with milk and honey, where everything's on tap and everything's okay. They will learn to worship me in the desert first before they do it in the green land of the promised land. There's something significant here because often it is in the desert place where we do not have all the material resources that we've got so used to that we find ourselves confronting what do I have in my relationship with God? And desert spirituality becomes an opportunity for prioritizing the big things in our faith journey. And the big thing is developing our worshipful heart, even in times of privation when we've lost things. Secondly, six times we're again told in the book of Exodus that once they got to that desert place, the children of Israel moaned and complained and more than once hinted, we don't mind going back, you know. At least we knew where we were before this pandemic hit us and this desert experience came our way. We knew our job descriptions. We knew what was expected of us. Let's go back so that we can eat again the garlic, the onions and the leeks that they describe. You can imagine how their breath smelled. But let's go back. And often the desert place uh, is that crucible of stripping us of, if you like, all that we now no longer need to carry. Not so we can go back on a nostalgia trip. Let's get away from thinking that once we get through this pandemic, we can go back to how it used to be. It's almost a case of saying, what do I now need to put down? Because I recognize it no longer serves God's purpose. And what do I need to keep that still has life in it? and resources me. And so that complaining actually had a purpose. It was like a disciplining and a stripping down of all the things they'd come to rely upon in order to strengthen them to move on into all that God had for them. And thirdly, surprisingly enough, the desert is mentioned as a place for rest and renewal. I used to remember singing that old hymn, uh, in the school choir when I was 10, uh, that, oh, for the, that I had wings like a dove so that I could fly away. Well, this is not about escapism. This is actually the words of the psalmist 
in Psalm 55 and verses 6 and 7, where he's having his own battles about who he is and about God's purposes for him. And sometimes he's finding the going so tough, he longs for the desert place, the silence, the absence of distractions, the place to be still and know that I am God. This may sound very back to front, but one of the first charismatic outpourings of the Holy Spirit in the early church was actually people finding their space in the desert to be alone with God. Perhaps the most famous one was a monk called Antony, who when his parents died just outside Cairo in the third century AD, he gave all his, what would have then been millions away, gave some to his sister to make sure she was well looked after, but he gave everything away so that he could be relieved of what he felt kept him from being closer to God and goes out into the desert place. He actually found a cave and there became a man of great power of prayer and kings tracked their way out to the desert to seek his advice. In fact, his prayer life was so attractive, he ended up with hundreds joining him. So he was constantly moving into more remoter places. But there was a great move of the Holy Spirit in the early church to bring people aside. Now, the model they've got for that, of course, is the way that Jesus, according to Mark's gospel, was forever wanting just to get aside to his equivalent of the cave, the desert or quiet place, to be restful and renewed and be alone with God. So the desert is a metaphor of finding that place of being closer to God. And I'm hoping this pandemic, far from making you feel restricted and trapped at home, as an opportunity to actually learn how to be still and know God and take that with us into the future. Fourthly and finally, the desert is a place to test out and develop our ministry and our calling. It's fascinating, isn't it, that two uh, uh, developments of ministry occur for us in the desert. One is John the Baptist, who we're told was doing his baptizing in Bethabara, which was out into the wilderness or desert. And people came in flocks to hear his message and to renew their commitment to God. John developed his discipleship and his ministry in the context of the desert and changed communities and towns in the process. And again with Jesus, the second one, where we're reminded that he goes armed with knowing he's the son and confronts the enemy, Satan. I'm sure this wasn't the only time Jesus had spiritual battles, but this, if you like, was the test case. The lessons he was to learn here were going to stand him in good stead for the rest of his life. It was a place of development. And I love this little quote from Krish Kandir from his book, Church Crisis and creativity, where he writes, the pandemic stroke desert has challenged us to restore our hearts to God's heart and gain a clearer perspective on our ministry and on our leadership priorities. So ministry is one of the benefits of this desert spirituality. Now, I'm not endorsing the pandemic. I'm not saying let's stay here forever and ever. Amen. But I'm saying the scripture teaches us that we need to learn God's purposes as we too journey from time to time through our desert experiences where we're stripped of what we don't need to carry anymore and hold on to what is essential for our well-being, for our personal flourishing and for our moving on in life. Perhaps there are two things I'd like to underline uh, about desert resourcing. Just two simple things as spiritual disciplines. One is recalibration and the other is revitalization. Here's a definition of that word recalibrate from some dictionaries I've looked in. 
It's when something or someone has drifted off course and needs a fresh point of reference in order to come back to the true. And I think this is always the challenge of the desert moments that we have in our lives, is to examine what we've been doing, what we are doing. Does it still need to be done? Is there some way we can recalibrate so we breathe fresh life into such things? Not just go back to how it was, but actually to find a new expression of it. This is always the challenge to the church, to change and transform. I remember I used to have some battles when I was an incumbent about using versions of scripture that weren't the King James Bible or bringing in service routines that weren't the Book of Common Prayer. And I remember wanting to, to try and point out how we don't chuck all this out, but we learn its appropriateness. And so I read from a book uh, that was a comment on what was going on in the 1600s. And this book had a little passage that went like this. When this event happened in the church, 16,000 armed men took to the streets of London to try and take the capital. A 100,000 people from various places around the country rose up in revolt and attacked the churches. And the reason for all this extreme violence the introduction of the Book of Common Prayer into the life of the early church. The Book of Common Prayer was regarded as outrageous, revolutionary, and to be stopped in its tracks. Oh, to keep the Latin that we have grown up with. Oh, to sing the songs of the liturgy that we had then, which were no doubt wondrous things. But can you imagine doing our services today still? in Latin, and incidentally, most people had not got a clue what the Latin words were. There's a place for development and growth, but it's recalibration, not chucking stuff out, but learning what's the vital that we still want to keep to recalibrate. If you like, one of the lessons we've learned from this lockdown is the difference between serving people's needs and holding services. You would think the second met the first, but the pandemic has shown us that we can still serve people's needs without having access to the kind of services we normally do because we recalibrate the way we do this. And I just want to say, as we come out of lockdown, can we think and recalibrate, how does God want us to be his church now? And secondly, and finally, is revitalization. You know, when you're in desert places, you dig deep to resource yourself. You look for water, maybe in ways that you wouldn't normally. And I find that in this pandemic time, with the restrictions we've all had to battle with, it's enabled us to find what keeps me flourishing and alive. And I make the most of that. And can we keep that attitude alive? when we come out of our lockdown life, so that the lessons we learned, we take with us into what is to come. I want to just close this reflection on desert spirituality with a quote actually from a movie script uh, of Lord of the Rings. You'll remember the scenario well enough yourselves, but I'm thinking particularly of Sam Gadji, uh, who was that faithful retainer of Mr. Frodo, who never left his side and was always there to support him. Here's some encouraging words we can learn from that script of the movie taken from Tolkien's great novel. Here goes. It's like in the great stories, Mr. Frodo, the ones that really mattered, full of darkness and danger they were, and sometimes you just didn't know the end. Because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad had happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing, this shadow. Even darkness must pass. A new day will come. And when the sun shines, and it will shine out the clearer, 
Those were the stories that stayed with you. That meant something, even if you were too small to understand why. But I think, Mr Frodo, I do understand, I know now. Folk in these stories had lots of chances of turning back, only they didn't, because they were holding on to something. There's some good in this world, Mr Frodo, and it is worth fighting for. What are you holding on to that's good to keep, that you've learned from God through this pandemic stroke desert journey? It's worth holding on to as you recalibrate and revitalize your life and move on. Amen.
Let's continue being in God's presence as Matt brings us our prayers for today. Heavenly Father, let us focus on you just as we focus on our smartphones. Lord, distract us with your majesty in the same way we are distracted by bubblegum TV shows and box sets. Lord, let us run to you in the same way we run home after a hard day to a cold drink. Lord, let us worry about serving you as much as we worry about pointless things we cannot change. Only you are the ultimate transformer of lives. Shape us into the instruments of your love and glory. Lord Jesus, we offer up to you the friends and family of Paul who sadly passed away this week following his attack. Bring your peace upon his loved ones during this hard time. Please join me in a moment of silence as we remember the loved ones we have lost in the past.
Lord, we pray for the people and countries at war across the globe. Let your wisdom come upon the leaders of these nations and groups so that suffering can end. Father, make us more like your Son, Christ, in our actions, motives and our daily life. Remind us that words can crush or lift each other up. Help us to be like Christ as we love others. Help us to love strangers as much as our friends. Lord, being Christ-like is not easy, but with your strength we can achieve anything. Nations can be transformed and healed. Hearts can be set on fire with your Holy Spirit. Please, Heavenly Father, as people have to worship online, send your spirit into our households. Let it be the glue that binds our families. Amen.
Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you heard from God and I hope you were able to feel his presence. And let's just pray as we finish today's worship. Lord Jesus, thank you for being with us. Thank you for speaking to us. Help us to act on what we've heard today. I pray that you would bless each and every one of us as we go about our weeks this week. In Jesus' name, Amen. So much has changed in our world lately. Wo auch immer du bist, ruf seinen Namen an. Jesus. 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 Jesus.